Hello, movers, shakers, and change makers. Welcome. This is Vivek Modi, your host for today's episode of AES Speaker Series. I welcome Naveen Raju tuning in live from New York. Bonjour, namaste, and good morning, Navi. Namaste. Bonjour. Now, before I introduce Navi properly, allow me to say a few words about Asian European Society. We are a nonprofit student run organization. We exist to foster the bonding between Asia and Europe and therefore we organize a wide range of events such as this one. So if we interest you, if our work interests you, reach out to us on our website, aesmuc.de and uh, on our social media handles. From beginning, we encourage you to ask questions. You can do that by using uh, the Q&A function on your screen. Now coming to today's topic, Jugaad and Frugal Innovation. So all of you who are not familiar with this word, this concept of Jugaad emerged in emerging countries and developing economies where there was a scarcity of resources and an immense need of innovation. Now, someone has said a good picture is worth thousand words. And in our generation of instant gratification, probably a good video equals a million words. So I let this video do the job of explaining you the concept of Jugaad. नाव का इंतजार मुझे गवारा न था मुझे मेरे प्यार से मिलना ही था मेरी बेकरारी ने मुझे आविष्कारी बना दी पर प्यार को भी अविष्कार का सहारा लेना ही पड़ता अविष्कार ही मेरी नूर का नूर है नई खोज ही मेरी जिंदगी का जुनून है माय टेक्नोलॉजी So I hope you found the video interesting and I can promise today's session is going to be even more interesting. And this brings me to introducing our uh, host and today's speaker, Navi Raju. Navi is a New York based innovation and leadership thinker who advises senior executives worldwide on a breakthrough growth strategies. A fellow at Cambridge Judge Business School, Navi has served on the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Previously, he served as a vice president at Forest Research Institute, a leading technology research and advisory firm in Boston. In 2013, Navi won the prestigious Thinkers 50 award given to a management thinker who reshapes the way we think about and practice innovation. He delivered a TED talk in 2014 on frugal innovation that got over 1.8 million views. Navi co-authored Frugal Innovation, How to Do Better with Less, which was published by The Economist in 2015, as well as the global bestseller Jugaad Innovation. He's a sought after keynote speaker, widely quoted in international media. Born and raised in Pondicherry, India, he holds dual French and American citizenship. He attended Ecole Centrale Paris and Yale School of Management. He lives in Brooklyn, New York, and he is a lifelong student of Ayurveda, yoga, and Vipassana meditation. We all have been looking so much forward to hear you, Navi. So over to you. Thank you so much, Vivek, for uh, hosting this uh, uh, webinar. And uh, it's very timely to discuss about frugal innovation. And uh, one thing, Vivek, I think there is uh, someone from the audience who said that they couldn't hear uh, very well. So if you don't mind, just yes, yes, the audio I will, to make I sure will. that. Uh, no, just a moment, Ravi. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So. Can anyone tell us whether they hear us or not right now? Can anyone update? Okay, perfect. Thank you very right, much. Good. So everyone, yeah, if there's any issue, just let us know. Um, so thank you so much for AES for hosting me uh, today. I must say that this particular webinar is uh, 
very exciting for me because I've been doing a lot of webinars uh, since COVID began. Uh, but uh, being uh, Indian, French, and American, uh, I always love to uh, present in venues like this uh, that bring together different cultures. And that's exactly what AES is doing. Um, so uh, today's topic is about uh, this uh, weird concept called Jugal. Then you will be wondering what it is and it will explain in a few minutes as well as about this notion of frugal innovation. And the subtitle is really what I will be uh, explaining about today, which is how do we go about, uh, as we emerge from the health crisis today, go about co-creating a better world, but with fewer resources. And the reason is because, as you know, uh, we are going to enter a long recession that will last until 2022, according to IMF. So we have to figure out a way to deal with resource scarcity, but at the same time, we have these amazing uh, opportunities to rethink about our economic system and social system and make them better. So I want to begin with uh, the whole idea of, you know, what is frugal innovation? And I actually learned about frugal innovation uh, growing up in India. Um, I uh, was brought up in a city called Pondicherry, which is a former uh, French colony in uh, southern India. And in the 70s, we had a lot of uh, resource scarcity because uh, water was rationed. It was uh, very dry. So me and my brothers would wake up at uh, 5 o'clock in the morning to fill these buckets with water. And we'll use a bucket of water each day to cook and clean ourselves. And so I learned very early on to uh, be very mindful of resources like water, which are scarce, and learn to do better with less. Even though I uh, grew up in a middle-class family, um, I was, uh, my house was located in an armored slum. So many of my uh, friends were very poor people. And I noticed something very interesting about these poor kids because they didn't have clothes on them, uh, they didn't have a fixed house, but they all had a huge smile. And uh, so I learned very early on that uh, a person who has less is not a lesser being. I think it's very important because we keep hearing about poor people. What I found is that poor people actually have a lot to teach us. And, and, and that's something that I will discuss with you uh, this morning as well. The importance that as we enter a crisis, all of us will feel having less. And it's important that we don't let that make us believe that we are lesser beings. As a matter of fact, I discovered that less is more uh, because when you put a limitation on resources, you remove the limitation on creativity. As you can see by the example of this kid who plays cricket, which is the national sport in India, uh, where he actually protects his knees uh, using just cardboard, right? So you find this amazing ingenuity that emerges in the environment of resource constraints. And so I dedicated the last uh, 13 to 14 years now to study this phenomenon of how entrepreneurs in uh, emerging markets where they don't have a lot of resources are able to transcend these constraints and come up with incredible innovation. Uh, like Mansu Prajapati, uh, who is a porter by training uh, in India, who has uh, developed a fridge made entirely of clay, and it can keep fruits and vegetables fresh for a couple of days, and it doesn't require electricity, and it's 100% biodegradable. So you can see that this person didn't even finish high school, but he was able to tap into his skills, his expertise as a porter, and use that to create value for others in his community. And uh, another example, this time from healthcare, which is equally uh, you know, very relevant today, of course, with the health crisis, is about how we are going to deal uh, when billions of people need help, right? Need to improve the health system, health. So this is an example of, um, uh, from healthcare system. Um, there are 20 million babies born prematurely every year. And uh, many of them are born in uh, emerging markets and uh, up to 5 million of these kids die because they cannot be kept in an incubator. Of course, in the Western world, 
we put them in incubator made of plexiglass, which cost about $20,000 and requires electricity to operate. And you can imagine in a poor country uh, like India, um, $20,000, a lot of money, and we don't have electricity, which is reliable. So five students from Stanford University came up with this ingenious solution, which is to basically ask themselves, why do we have to create an incubator that looks like an incubator? Why don't we create another product that does the same function as an incubator, but is designed with a very different form? And they came up with this solution, which looks like a, a small sleeping bag. It's called the Embrace Incubator. And uh, inside you have uh, a material, which is like wax, and you can put that on a heating pad, it melts, and you reinsert that into the, 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 the bag. And then you can keep the baby at constant temperature for six hours straight. And this simple solution cost only $200, which is 1% of the cost of incubators. And it also allows the mothers to have a close contact, physical contact with the baby. So this simple ingenious solution has already saved the lives of 300,000 babies. So you can see how a frugal solution can have a huge societal impact. And uh, when I present this in the West, people say, yeah, but you know, this kind of frugal innovation is interesting, but uh, we in the West, we can send a man to the moon. Can you guys do that frugally? Well, actually India showed that we not only can send a spacecraft to, Mars, to, uh, to uh, the moon, but we can go beyond that in the solar system. Uh, actually in September, 2015, there was a spacecraft launched by NASA called uh, MAVEN, which entered the Mars orbit. Uh, and this project was developed for $670 million, and it took NASA five years to develop this project. But the same week in September 2015, there was another spacecraft that entered Mars orbit, and this was sent by India. It's called the Mangalian, and this mission was conducted for just $74 million, which is 10 times less than what NASA spent, and it was done three times faster because the Indians actually used the software talent to do a lot of the simulation work of the spacecraft design in computers rather than building physical prototypes like NASA did. Why India has to do that is because you need to understand that what NASA spends in a single month is what the Indian Space Agency spends the entire year. So you can understand that when you have such resource constraints, you have to think outside the box and come up with very ingenious solutions so you can stretch the limited budget you have to create more value. And you see this scientific uh, approach now being applied today to deal with COVID as well. So there is an interesting uh, you know, rivalry now within India in the scientific community in India to see who can come up with a cheaper uh, test kit for COVID. Um, and you know that I know that in Germany, there's been a, you know, a widely deployed the testing, but in India, we didn't have the technology to do that yet. But now we are developing homegrown technologies like these researchers at the National Science Scientific uh, Network called CSIR came up with a six euro uh, paper uh, strip test uh, to test against for COVID. And then next thing you know, we have other researchers at the famous Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi who came up with an even cheaper test kit, which cost only three euros. And now more uh, entrepreneurs are now coming up with a one euro test kit. Makes sense, right? 1.3 billion people in India, right? You need to bring the, bring the cost down as much as possible so that everyone can be tested very quickly. But this example is even more amazing. Uh, this shows uh, how a group of entrepreneurs, when they come together, they can co-create solutions against COVID much faster than one company with centralized big R&D lab. So this is a, a movement called the M19. It's a group of makers. So makers means that uh, these are like uh, people like MacGyvers, you know, with the clever thoughts, but also have technologies like 3D printing, et cetera to quickly create a solution uh, with very limited resources. And uh, this group of makers in India called M19, within seven weeks, managed to produce one million 
face shields using simply the film used for, you know, uh, uh, for projectors, right? So simple materials being used to quickly create 1 million face shields, which is an incredible achievement. So you can see how, again, uh, India is also pioneering a new approach to manufacturing, which is much more decentralized, more distributed than what we may see in China with centralized big factories. So when we look at all these engineer solutions, uh, me and my co-authors, uh, we realize that there is a whole spectrum of frugal solutions. They go from relatively low tech solutions with very little technology, uh, developed in a grassroots bottom-up way by one or two entrepreneurs in villages and et cetera, but also user-driven. That means that I first focus on what the customer problem is, and then I come up with a solution. So I, develop, I identify the nail first, then I create the hammer, okay? So that's one end of the spectrum. And then you have another end of the spectrum, which is more R&D driven, more uh, you know, high tech uh, with new technologies like artificial intelligence, 3D printing, and often done in a traditional you know, R&D uh, environment with scientist engineers. But what is interesting is that they all share certain things in common, which is a secret method or a secret mindset. And that's what we wanted to find out. What is that secret mindset or method that all these frugal entrepreneurs use? And um, we ended up calling it the Jugad mindset. So what is Jugad? Uh, Jugad is a Hindi word, which means the ingenious ability to improvise an effective solution in a difficult context using minimum resources. So it's really what I call creative resilience. So when we face adversity, you don't run away from it, but you actually embrace the adversity and turn it into advantage, come up with a solution with very simple uh, means. And uh, if you were to ask me, you know, which uh, character practices Jugad very well, it's my favorite uh, action hero, which is uh, MacGyver. As you know, in the 90s, he was a, I think there's a new series now on CBS. But unlike James Bond, right, he doesn't have fancy gadgets, electronic gadgets. Uh, and whenever he finds himself in trouble, he can pull himself out of the problem using simply, you know, is a Swiss army knife and duct tape or anything he can find around him, right? So that is really what I mean by creative resilience. It's the ability to transform adversity into an opportunity and do better with less. So in um, 2012, uh, we published a book called Jugad Innovation, where we tried to identify what are the key attributes of this uh, mindset, you know, this ability to look at a problem and see an opportunity and you know, be able to uh, creatively uh, come up with solutions that deliver better value with less. And uh, we identified three major attributes of this Jugad mindset, which have to do with uh, frugality, with what we call resilience plus, and being very inclusive. So what I want to do now is walk you through each of these uh, attributes, or you can call them principles, if you like, uh, which is about how to be frugal, how to be resilient, and how to be inclusive. And by the way, all three are highly relevant, as you can imagine, in current context, right? Um, so let's begin with how to become more frugal. So by that we mean it's important that uh, we all learn both in emerging markets, but also in the Western world to do better with less. That means essentially create more value, but also more values using limited resources. So what we mean by values, it's really about finding ways to create not only really more economic value, but also more social value, because inequality is a big problem, as you know, so we need to make the economy more inclusive and more ecological value. Uh, that means that we shouldn't just protect the environment, but we need to regenerate the environment as well. And then when it comes to resources, it's about reducing use of scarce resources with the recession, capital is gonna get scarce, energy and time. So it's about finding a way to create more value and values using wisely all the resources we have. But 
in a simpler way to understand this is I use this metaphor of a glass. What happens like this year, we are going to complain or worry that, you know, oh my God, we have a scarcity of tangible resources like money, energy, water, new technologies, right? They're getting more and more scarce. But instead of complaining about what you don't have, it's important that you go within yourself and figure out what are the existing resources you have. And many of the resources could be intangible resources like ingenuity, empathy, resilience, we all have, but also intellectual capital, social capital, uh, psychological capital, existing technologies and data. We have a lot of data around us. How do we leverage the diversity of our workforce? So we have all these amazing resources that we need to figure out a way to leverage and use them, these abundant resources, to address the scarcity of these other resources that we don't have, like money, energy, new technologies, et cetera. And uh, for example, um, instead of complaining, I don't have X, for example, I don't have water, right? Well, you might say, oh, I don't have water, but there's a lot of humidity in, you know, especially in summertime or in uh, tropical countries, right? So we have a startup uh, in Israel called uh, WaterGen that transforms humidity, they absorb the humidity in the air, and they convert that into drinkable water. And uh, they can deploy that quickly when there is an emergency somewhere, or it can be used as a permanent solution in uh, tropical countries. Likewise, you might say, oh, we don't have electricity, uh, what do we do about it, right? Uh, or you can say, oh, let's look around us. What do we have in abundance? We have a lot of ambient light. How do we take this abundant light and convert that into electricity? Because it's all about photons, right? Um, and this is what a startup called uh, Dracula Technologies has done. Uh, it's a French startup that has developed an amazing technology where they print tiny uh, photovoltaic uh, photovoltaic cells that can be embedded into daily products like your carry-on bag so that you don't have to worry about carrying your charger for your cell phone because the bag charges the phone for you right so this is the and by the way why this technology is important is because uh, we have about 50 billion objects in the world that will be connected to the internet we call that internet of things uh, we talk about industry 4.0, but all these uh, objects connected to the internet need to be powered and we can't put batteries in them, right? That's very, you know, uh, unfriendly to the environment. So the idea is how do we make each object generate its own electricity without depending on connection to a, you know, a electric grid or batteries? Likewise, you might say, oh, you know, we are in a recession, we can invest in new technologies. Well, rather than looking for new technologies, why don't we learn to leverage old existing technologies? So this is what a company called BeBound is doing. Uh, it's another startup, which basically uh, encourages uh, countries to not invest in 5G, but leverage the 2G network they already have. Why is that important? Well there are 95 billion people in the world, even today, who don't have access to the internet. But 95% of the planet is covered by 2G. So the question is, why don't we use something which is already available around the world to give access to data? So specifically, they have developed a technology which is able to compress data up to 300 times so that they simply piggyback on the SMS technology, you know, used for texting, which is the communication protocol in 2G. So they simply use an existing communication channel, which is SMS, to get access to data, okay? So it's a very jugad way of using an existing uh, technology, which is 2G, an existing communication protocol, which is SMS, very reliable, by the way, to give access securely and reliably and cheaply to the internet. And it's being used now in uh, many African countries, in India and Southeast Asia. 
And likewise, we have seen this uh, mindset of resourceful mindset in the crisis now, uh, where we had needed a lot of ventilators. We couldn't find them quickly. And uh, some entrepreneurs asked themselves, why don't we use existing technologies to create ventilators? For example, uh, James Tyson uh, was a British uh, inventor. Uh, they make vacuum cleaners, the famous Dyson vacuum cleaners. And uh, their engineers, in just 10 days, in 10 days, they were able to adapt their digital motor in their vacuum cleaner to turn, convert it into a ventilator. And they produced 15,000 ventilators in just 10 days, uh, in a couple of weeks, which have been uh, distributed to hospitals uh, in the UK and abroad. And finally, you may ask yourself, you know, we talk about, you know, big data, a lot of new data generated by internet and social media, et cetera, right? So instead of looking for more data, uh, why don't we use existing data to extract more value from existing data rather than, you know, generating more data? And this is what an uh, Indian startup called AlgoSerg uh, has uh, came up with as an idea. And what they do essentially is it's a platform, uh, it's a solution that automatically converts 2D images from X-ray devices automatically into 3D images. That means that you don't need to have a scanner or an MRI machine, right, to generate 3D images of your body. You just have to take an X-ray uh, Im image, which most hospitals have X-ray device, so they can just take the data from X-ray and then they can convert that using artificial intelligence into uh, 3D images. And this is being used today by orthopedic surgeons to do bone surgeries virtually in a computer environment so they can actually make do the operation in the physical world faster, better, and more reliably and get it right the first time. So this is an example of you know, leveraging existing data to create more value uh, for patients and for society. So in our book called Frugal Innovation that was published a couple of years ago, we actually identify different principles uh, on how companies can go about you know, doing better with less. Um, and you can take a look at it to better understand uh, the, the frugal dimension of what we talked about, about Jugaad. Um, but what I personally am interested, I know that frugal innovation is becoming more popular, but I want to talk about the two other attributes, which are for me more important than just being frugal, which is really this mindset of what I call resilient plus. What does that mean? See, the word resilient means that when, you, when, when an object gets a shock, right, it, go, it, it, it loses its shape and then it regains its original shape, right? That's the definition of resilience. That means that you take a hit, and you get back, right? Back to where you were, right? But Resilient Plus is actually when you face a problem, right? How can you turn the problem into the solution? In other words, how can you transform adversity into an opportunity, right? So let me give you an example. So this is a Kanak Das, a young man in India who was tired of riding his bicycle in his village because the roads were filled with potholes. And so they were slowing him down. So instead of complaining about the potholes as, and looking at the bumps as a problem, he said, what if I turn that into a solution? So he basically created a device that he attached to his bicycle that converts the bumps into acceleration energy. So the more bumps in the road, the faster the bike rides, okay? So this is for me what I call resilient plus. It's about turning the problem into a solution that works for you, not against you. And this mindset becomes very powerful in a corporate environment. For example, uh, this is the case of Hire, which is a major uh, Chinese uh, appliance company, the world leader. And uh, a couple of years ago, 10 years ago in China, they had complained from farmers uh, saying that the washing machine got clogged. And when the technician went to see that, they discovered that the farmers were using the washing machine to wash potatoes. Of course, you know, if you are, a, you know, a big German company like Bosch, you might like, you know, what the heck, you know, it says in a user manual, right? This is for washing clothes, not potatoes. This is ridiculous. 
But these guys were Jugaad thinkers. And they asked themselves, oh, maybe this farmer is not the only one who wants to wash potatoes. What if there is a new market opportunity, a new market segment? We haven't thought about it. So they came up with a new product line of washing machines that actually can also wash potatoes. And uh, they became a bestseller in, uh, in uh, China. And higher, as you know, uh, it's interesting because they don't have fixed departments like R&D, manufacturing, marketing. They have uh, 3,500 cross-functional teams. Uh, they call them micro-enterprises, which are very agile so that when they detected this uh, market need, they were able to quickly create a new product in just 10 weeks. I mean, 10 weeks, okay? That's never seen before. So they are very, very agile and very uh, quick in transforming adversity into an opportunity. And by the way, uh, Hire is also going to be setting up a big uh, uh, research center in Europe to basically promote the Chinese way of innovating and the Chinese way of management. So uh, check them out. Um, now, this is another example, right? So the example of Hire and the previous one with Kanak Das shows the importance of asking the question, you know, kids, uh, children always ask the question, right? Why not? They challenge the system, they challenge the status quo, and they always think outside the box, right? It's called lateral thinking. Uh, and uh, this was demonstrated a lot during the COVID crisis. So this is an example of uh, an Italian doctor in the Lombardy region in Italy, which was hardest hit by COVID. Uh, they were running off of ventilators. And of course, you know, he was trained to use ventilators in medical school, but they don't have ventilators and people are dying. So what do we do? Well, it turns out that he's a scuba diver, this doctor. So he asked himself, why don't we adapt a scuba diving mask into a respirator, a ventilator? So he took a, a scuba diving snorkeling mask from a company called Decathlon, a sports retailer company, and he adapted it to use as a ventilator with the help of a local uh, uh, innovation company called Izinova in Italy. And they basically created a valve, uh, which actually is called the Charlotte valve, which is 3D printed with a 3D printer. And that enables them to adapt the mask, the snorkeling mask to be used as a safe ventilator for patients. And they made this uh, design of the 3D printed uh, component open source so that anyone can download the design and 3D print locally in any city. And this simple solution has saved the lives of uh, thousands of patients worldwide. Um, so another example of asking the why not question is uh, the case of uh, Renault, the French car company, which asked themselves, why don't we make a car for 5,000 euros? And they came up with the Logan, uh, then the brand called Dacia since 2005. And today these entry level cars account for 40% of revenues for Renault. And they went one step further. And in 2015, they launched a car in India called Quid for only uh, 3,500 euros. And uh, the R&D spending for this car was three times less than what they typically spend when they build a car in France. And now they're going one step further by creating an electric car, which is about eight to 9,000 euros, uh, which is, again, this is frugal because they are reusing the same platform from the Quid car they developed in India. And with the same platform, they are now producing a car, electric car, which has been launched in China last year for less than 9,000 euros. And finally, to conclude, um, I want to talk about this uh, inclusive mindset, which I think is going to become very important. And what it means is that instead of telling customers, hey, you know, come join me, you know, I have a great product here. Um, I call it the Pharaoh complex, because you're sitting at the top of the pyramid and saying, you know, here's a fantastic product, come get it, right? But many customers are not going to have the income, right, uh, to afford your product. So you need to have the humility to adapt your product to meet their purchasing power. And that's what entrepreneurs in emerging markets are doing, right? Like Harish Hande, uh, who in India have uh, created an interesting solution 
to give access to uh, solar energy to the poorest people in India with a very innovative business model that allows them to pay daily for the clean electricity. So we in the West, we pay monthly, right? Monthly uh, subscription. But um, in this case, they, they make it more accessible for the poor people by paying daily a uh, few, cent, few cents every day. So again, right, it's about thinking about how can you take your complex, expensive solution and bring it down to the people at a price point they can afford. But this also means that, you know, and we are going to see that after COVID, it also means that in healthcare, in education, in many sectors, what's gonna happen is that, you know, instead of asking the patient to come to the hospital, the hospital has to find a way to come to the patient. How can we do that? Well, with telemedicine, and China has been practicing telemedicine for many years now, where doctors in cities can remotely consult with patients uh, in villages, and uh, they even use a WeChat, the instant messaging, to have video consultation with doctors remotely without having to physically travel, right, hundreds of miles to go see a doctor in a big city. And this uh, telemedicine solution has been very helpful during COVID because uh, there were doctors, uh, experts in lungs who were able to you know, remotely give advice to patients in Wuhan and other regions in China so that they were able to essentially uh, leverage uh, doctors anywhere in China to help patients wherever it was required. So I think telemedicine, tele-education, uh, mobile banking, everything is going to become mobile and tele. You can put the four letters tele, T-L-E-L-E -L -E, in front of any sector because that's what's going to happen after the crisis. And of course, inclusion becomes important in Europe because as you know, uh, this is a data from before COVID. 22% uh, of European population uh, faces poverty. And in America, 65% of Americans don't even have $500 in case of emergency. So we have to figure out a way to make all the basic services accessible, affordable to the average American and average Europeans. And this is the example I want to conclude with, which is a Comp Nickel, which claims to be a bank without a bank, banking without bank. Because essentially what they have come up with a solution is that uh, you basically walk into a local mom and pop store, a small store in your neighborhood, and you can just in five minutes open an account, bank account, you get a bank ID, but also you can do all the transactions online for a flat fee of 20 euros annually. Okay. So when they launched it a couple of years ago, uh, they thought they would only have, you know, a few thousand customers. And the next thing they know, they ended up opening a new account every five minutes. And today they have 1.5 million clients. Okay? This was before the recession this year. I'm sure that in coming years, they might, their goal is to get 2 million clients next year. Okay? So in summary, I would say that um, it's going to be important for us in today's environment to cultivate this uh, Jugad mindset, which is uh, all about being more frugal, more resilient and more inclusive. And as I said earlier, uh, according to IMF projections, uh, we are going to have a big recession uh, for the next two years. Uh, it's gonna hit harder the developed countries more than emerging markets, as you can see. And therefore, we have to figure out how instead of complaining that we don't have all the resources, we have a scarcity of you know, money, capital, energy, and technologies, we need to figure out a way to cleverly reuse and repurpose existing resources that are abundant to uh, deliver more economic and social value and, uh, and ecological value as well. And finally, uh, I'm a big fan of also looking at how can uh, developed countries and emerging markets come together to use frugal innovation to co-create solutions uh, in the case of healthcare or energy or uh, food for humanity as a whole. And you can check out this article I published for the World Economic Forum on a couple of projects that uh, France and India are doing together uh, with frugal innovation as the bridge between these two cultures. So with that, I want to uh, thank you for your attention and uh, we are going to transition to uh, the Q&A portion. 
Thank you very much, Navi, for such an insightful, interesting, and I would say simply thrilling <laughs> presentation. I mean, from the Dracula bag to converting water to ventilators, everything looked so exciting to me. And I personally would like to get that Dracula guys. Uh, <laughs> I would like yes, to get too. in touch with them. Yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Great. Then I will start our Q&A session with a couple of questions on Jugard. Uh, so you mentioned a lot of time about mindsets, mindsets importance in Jugard. So I would like to know whether this Jugard and whole food frugal innovation is a mindset or a skill. Sure. Uh, yes, uh, Jugard actually is uh, both a mindset. Uh, remember the graphic. So it's a mindset that is basically uh, very resilient, so that when you face a problem, you don't run away. You basically embrace the problem and you find a way to, you know, have the confidence, the creative confidence to say, hey, this problem, I can overcome that, but I don't overcome the problem. I literally turn the problem into a solution, right? So it's first and foremost a mindset, which is very resilient, uh, very confident. And uh, it's also not just the mindset, but it's also something that comes from here, right? It's really the empathy, the compassion, because all the examples I gave, these are entrepreneurs who actually want to help the patients in the case of the doctors, uh, in the case of uh, Mansu Prashapati, he wants to basically help his uh, fellow citizens in the village to keep fruits and vegetables fresh, right? Because they don't have a refrigerator. So it comes from the heart as much as the mind and then the hands, that's the skill, right? So it's a combination of mind, heart and skill and the skill is what is really about, you know, looking around and say, like MacGyver, right? What are the resources I have mm -hmm. that I can put it together to quickly create a solution? And the other skill is also working together. That's why I gave a couple of examples where in the India, for example, the entrepreneurs who work together, 300 makers coming together to produce 1 million, uh, you know, shields. Why that's a skill? Because even if you don't know something, right, you're not an expert in healthcare, you can learn from others, right? And, and that's why I say that in the 20th century, knowledge is power. In the 21st century, ignorance is power. Because the less you know about a sector, the more easily you can disrupt a sector, right? Mm -hmm. Think about Uber. Uber know nothing about mobility. They disrupted it. Airbnb knows nothing about hotels, hospitality. The disruptive. So the less you know, sometimes it's a blessing because you can come up with these Jugad solutions, right? Uh, to transform and disrupt these sectors. So it's a, it's a mindset. It's, a, it's about connecting with your heart for compassion. And the skills is about, you know, being in ability to improvise a solution quickly and to work collaboratively. Going forward to the next question is about a little bit of criticism uh, on Jugard that I recently read on one of the articles. And the main article quotes that the existence of Jugard is the evidence that the circumstances of the country are so bad that it's smart people are not doing what smart people in uh, a society should do. What would you say on this? Of course, it's a, it's a criticism I've been hearing for 12 years now, you know, since I've been, uh, you know, writing and publishing about and talking about Jugad. It's, it's correct that there are, a couple, uh, there are two ways to answer that. Um, we should understand that Jugad actually is very powerful uh, when the existing system is not working. So it doesn't necessarily try to attack a system or violate the system, abuse the system. Some people do. Uh, it leads to things like corruption, you know, bad things. We see that also in the West, right? So when you try to game the system, abuse the system, that's not, that's a bad jugad. The good jugad happens in following ways where the system is not helping people. Like look in America, right? We have a rule of law, amazing system, so-called richest country. I live in New York, the system failed. It failed miserably. And this is the epicenter of COVID. New York is the richest city in the world with the amazing system, right? Supposedly healthcare system, but it fails. So when the system fails, despite being a great system, then these entrepreneurs have no choice. They have to use Jugal, right? To survive and adapt kind of thing. 
So that's something to keep in mind is that um, there is a kind of bad jugad where people try to game the system, often for selfish reasons. Mm -hmm. And then there is the good jugad when you realize that the system is not helping people. So I need to step up and come up with solutions that address the needs of the society in healthcare, energy, or education. Um, so yes, uh, for me, jugad is just creative thinking. And it's not about... Uh, what you do, but how you do Jugad and why you do Jugad. If you do Jugad for the right purpose, it could have amazing positive consequences. If you use Jugad for selfish, uh, very kind of, you know, uh, 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 negative uh, purpose, then you're going to generate very negative consequences. We have a next question, which goes very much in the lines with what you are mentioning right now. Um, so initially where Jugaad was, you know, in, in the developing countries uh, from where it was, uh, where it emerged from, uh, there was not a huge focus particularly on uh, sustainability ethics or as our participant asks about equality. So I will uh, quickly uh, quote an example uh, of a Jugaad uh, innovation uh, that I read recently uh, in Mumbai. Uh, one guy was offering insurances in a local train when you get caught uh, without a ticket. So it was a jugad against the system. And so, so what would you uh, tell to uh, such people and innovators um, who are trying to use jugad uh, not in a very ethical way? And what should one definitely keep in mind to, uh, about sustainability, ethics, and equality while using jugad principles? Sure. Uh, I think if you look at the example of the Dracula technologies, right, that's an interesting jugad that connects with sustainability, right, which says essentially, you know, we can't afford to power every object with batteries, right? That's not sustainable. So rather, I look at what already exists, right, which is the abundant light, and how can I use that to my advantage so that I can use light and convert that into energy, clean energy, right? So that is an example of how do you connect uh, this Jugad mindset with sustainability. And you will see a lot of examples like that coming up in the future, uh, where um, in my book, I talk about this idea of, you know, uh, how do we create, for example, a factory, uh, a company called Interface in America has done that, where they have built a factory in Australia that not only pollutes less, uh, uses less water, which is sustainable, but there's a concept called regeneration that goes beyond sustainability. And that means having a positive impact on society and uh, the planet. So this factory built by uh, Interface, uh, what it does is that uh, it actually uh, generates uh, as a byproduct of the production process, it generates drinkable water, okay? And that water is then distributed to the local communities. And it also has uh, solar panels and uh, 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 additional solar energy generated by the factory they don't need, that's being deployed to the small businesses around the factory, okay? So there suddenly the factory becomes a virtuous factory that not only does less harm, but does more good, right, for the local community. So that's an example of Jugad because you're saying that, oh, you know, actually, I don't want to just create a factory that does less harm. How can I create a factory that does more good, mm -hmm. right? So that connects, you know, Jugad with sustainability as well. And then ethics, as I said earlier, uh, the way to think about is, you know, when you are developing a solution uh, and you're thinking creatively, right, is the solution just about making myself better, uh, basically make money, taking shortcuts, right? Uh, or is it a solution that is gonna actually help others? So that's why I think Jugad begins here, not here, right? Because if it begins here, it, it, here we have two, two parts of the brain, which is the limbic system, which is the fight or flight, and it's all about survival. If you use Jugad in a survival mode, like right now in the crisis, we tend to, find shortcuts, you know, find a way to game the system because it's about survival, right? But if you use imagination, which is the prefrontal cortex, the new part of the brain, 
then you come up with amazing solutions that are way more creative, but also are about helping others. So the ethics in my, for me, ethics come is if you're able to go beyond the impulses of the limbic system, which is all about survival, and really connect with this part, the prefrontal cortex, where you can actually think in a more systemic way, you know, and say, okay, you know, how can I create a solution that brings value, not only for me, but for society and the planet. And that kind of uh, holistic thinking only happens, you know, when you connect the, you know, the prefrontal cortex with compassion in your heart. Yeah, I think any technology or any tool, um, it can be used either ways. Same questions have been raised for artificial intelligence and all other uh, modern tech that is coming in. And yeah, it's all about how you want to use it. And the purpose, what yeah. is the, the, why, the why question, right? Why, mm -hmm. why you're using it? Not what, not how, but why? And then the, the fourth question is who? The self-awareness, you know? The idea of you know, who I am, you know? And what are my skills and talent? And that's what I started with the Mansu Prachapati because he started with the who question. He said, there is a problem. How can I solve it? Well, I'm not an engineer. I don't have an MBA. I don't have a PhD. I never finished high school. But you know what? I am trained as a porter, right? So how can I use what I am, which is you know, who I am, my, my, my skills, to create a solution? So the who question is very, very important as well. The self-awareness, you know? And that's how you discover your gifts and talents, right? That you can use to serve others. The next question is from Seema. So Seema asked, asks, uh, do you think Jugaad uh, needs to be uh, formalized or structured? It could, uh, yes, in our book, actually, we say that uh, not necessarily formalized because then you're going to destroy the spirit of Jugaad, but you can uh, integrate Jugaad with the formal system. So let me give you uh, one example, which I really love. Um, this is an example of Ford, the, um, uh, the uh, US car company. Mm -hmm. I was about to say BMW because BMW <laughs> did something in Munich. So you'll be interested to know that uh, because they learned from Ford and they tried to copy it in Munich. So we'll explain that later. So Ford, what they did is that essentially uh, they discovered the problem is the following. They have a very formal R&D system which helped them remember, right? Henry Ford is, is started the car industry. So the formal system, mass production, you know, structured R&D and big R&D budgets, the classic way of developing products, making products, they mastered it. The problem is that after 100 years of doing that, as you know, the car industry is changing rapidly with what we call car sharing, uh, autonomous uh, driving, uh, mobility as a service. So all these new concepts means that the notion of car is going to change completely. It's not about cars, it's about mobility as a service. You go from a product to a service now. And therefore, the engineers were not uh, you know, thinking the right way to come up with the new innovations that will help Ford shape the new market. They were basically, you know, in uh, business terms, they were swimming in the red ocean as opposed to jumping into the blue ocean, which is this new market that is emerging, mobility as a service. So what they did is essentially they created a Jugaad environment, uh, which is essentially a maker space in Detroit, uh, near the headquarters of Ford, where they allowed their engineers to go tinker in the evenings and weekends. So they can come up with, they can go with the ideas and then tinker, come up with a prototype using 3D printers, laser cutters, et cetera. And then they can go back to the boss and say, hey, look, here's my Jugaad solution. What do you think about it? And what happens is that when you show your boss, who is an engineer, an actual prototype, it's more likely that he might be interested. Because if you only show him on paper your idea, he may dismiss it. But when they actually show the prototype, everybody gets excited. And then everybody wants to work on it and improve it, right? So in doing so, within three years, uh, Ford managed to double the number of patents. But not just the quantity of patents, but the quality of patents. That means that all the patents they are filing are really positioned to help Ford win in the new market, right, of the 21st century. 
not maintain the old market of the 20th century. So that's a great example where you keep the existing formal system with R&D and everything, but then you create a separate environment, which is very you know, flexible, very frugal, very you know, jugad in a way, and then you start to create linkages between these two worlds. Uh, that's what I recommend, uh, at least for the Western companies, because they invested so much in the formal system, you don't want to get rid of it, but you want to integrate that with a new environment, which is much more you know, fluid, much more dynamic. So Navi, most of the Jugaad initially and from where it has emerged, it comes from uh, people, so normal people, not uh, academics or researchers, or at least not trained uh, that way, let's say. So is there a system or mechanism or a platform to, to recognize such people and what governments and nonprofits should do to uh, encourage uh, frugal innovation and Jugaad where it is needed the most? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, in India, we have already some, some initiatives. Uh, uh, there's the National Innovation Foundation in India uh, that, uh, and the Honey Bee Network mm -hmm. led by Professor Anil Gupta, which has actually documented a lot of these uh, grassroots innovations. Uh, and uh, they have documented hundreds, uh, sorry, thousands of these uh, grassroots solutions. And the video you showed is one of them. And uh, so you can check them out. It's called the Honey Bee Network. That's in India. Um, in, the, in, uh, in, the, in Morocco, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, the Société Générale, which is a major uh, bank, uh, teamed up with a, a, a nonprofit organization in Morocco to create a platform where they're going to actually uh, identify uh, bottom-up solutions developed by entrepreneurs to address uh, COVID. Right? So there's a lot of interest now in Africa to create such a platform to identify, uh, document, and uh, connect different innovators uh, who are tackling you know, these issues at the grassroots level. Um, and then in uh, France, uh, we have uh, different platforms emerging, which are about open source platforms where we can identify uh, grassroots innovations. And when the crisis happened with COVID, um, the French government actually launched different websites to actually uh, identify these existing solutions mm -hmm. at the grassroots level. But then there's a last example, which is very exciting. Um, the UNDP, uh, the United Nations Development uh, Program, has changed the business model since last year. So what they realized finally is that uh, instead of, oh, by the way, it's uh, even more interesting, it's a project done in partnership with the German government, the German uh, aid organization, right? Foreign Affairs and the uh, German aid organization. BMZ. BMZ, exactly. So, and what they are doing is that essentially uh, exactly what we talked about. So UNDP finally realized that instead of coming up with a cookie cutter solution into Africa or you know, uh, India and try to impose that solution and it never works, why don't we identify existing solutions at the grassroots level and then try to amplify, scale them up? Uh, so they set up uh, 70 accelerator labs in different countries around the world. And it's again, right, it's going from the old model, which is, you know, UNDP as a central agency and, you know, just deploying solutions like this. They are actually creating these agile units, 70 of them around the world, who actually go and identify existing solutions in education, energy, healthcare, et cetera. And then they connect them with other stakeholders, uh, nonprofits, uh, private sector, government agencies, and uh, investors to scale them up. So UNDP realized that you know, they need to create now a network, a platform that actually identifies these you know, existing solutions and then try to you know, scale them up. So it's, it's called UNDP accelerator labs so i think the key is to uh, adopt a bottoms up approach rather than a top down approach you need both i mean the sense that so why you so undp what they're doing is that they are saying okay we have the bottom up so let's encourage that but then when it comes to scaling them or you know or connecting entrepreneurs then you need the top down platform right so that you know you can identify best practices and you can uh, cross-fertilize ideas, you know, mm -hmm. cross-pollinate ideas, 
Um, and so you need a combination of bottom up because most inventions are bottom up. Uh, and then you need a top down structured way of connecting the entrepreneurs, sharing best practices and uh, helping them scale up the solutions by connecting them with you know, investors, uh, nonprofit or private uh, entities. So now we've, unfortunately we are running out of time. Uh, we have several questions, but uh, we won't be able to cover them all. Um, so I will take one more question. Sure. And uh, yeah, I was thinking we can go over time maybe, you know, yeah, if you want yeah. to questions. Yeah, sure. Um, so some international players in emerging markets do very well, whereas some fail terribly. To quote an example, Google, uh, Coca-Cola, McDonald's have done fantastic in India, but Amazon is struggling and now Amazon is also doing relatively fine. However, Apple, uh, according to a lot of surveys and reports, have failed terribly in India. And Apple has, you know, uh, their standard uh, strategies to ask more for more, which is completely opposite to what you uh, say about Jugad. So do you think uh, such firms in emerging markets can reshape their strategy and adopt some Jugad principles? Sure. Uh, and Amazon actually already have, uh, you know, adopted Jugad, right? I yes. mean, the way they are selling in uh, slums in Mumbai, et cetera, you know, leveraging grassroots uh, logistics network, right? To address the last mile problem. And so they are becoming Indian in a way. Uh, I start with this because remember the example I gave you with the pyramid with the pharaoh complex? So Apple mm -hmm. suffers from the pharaoh complex. They are saying, hey, you know, here's a shiny product, you know, come get it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, no, that doesn't work. So you need to kind of come down in price and accessibility to meet the average Indian customer, right? Uh, with their purchasing power. And so, yes, as you know, they made announcements that they're going to create a new version of the iPhone, which is going to cost three times less, you know, uh, than the U.S. version. And it will be made locally. Uh, and that's also important. That means that uh, you have to localize the whole manufacturing and supply chain to bring down the cost of, you know, uh, production. So they, they're learning that. Um, and so what Apple is learning is that um, it's about being agile. So McDonald's became successful in India because they introduced uh, items in the menu like, you know, aloo burger, et cetera, uh, which are basically uh, adapted to the taste of mm -hmm. Indian palate, right? Yeah. And so I think, you know, when they say, I know when in Rome, you know, behave like a Roman, uh, and I think that's what it is. Uh, I think multinationals often uh, fail in India is because they don't know how to adapt their products how to adapt their business models, how to adapt their supply chains to fit the local context, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, Renault is a great example, which actually developed this car from the ground up. So that's also important. You can just, even Apple, right, is fine because they are taking, you know, a, a expensive product and make it, you know, more affordable. But ultimately, if you look at why Samsung and Nokia became very successful in India, is because they designed and the, the, the phones entirely in India, using mm -hmm. Indian engineers. So when you develop a solution bottom up from scratch, uh, it's more likely to succeed because you are designing the solution by working with local customers to understand what the needs are. So it's very likely to succeed. But if you bring a, a design from Silicon Valley and you just make it more affordable, right? And by producing locally, it may work for the middle class, upper middle class, but Apple can never crack the, you know, the mainstream market in India mm -hmm. unless they completely rethink the product by designing it differently in the Indian context with Indian talent. So I think as they term it being global is the way out probably. <laughs> Absolutely. They, and they have to, uh, I think everyone has to become global, especially with the borders closing. See, mm -hmm. this is important. So what's going to happen is that all companies, all multinationals. Uh, I mean, this doesn't get serious because for example, in America, there's a lot of push with the wall with China, right? To bring yeah. back manufacturing here. And I can tell you that many uh, US companies are not trained for it, right? Mm -hmm. Because they exported all the manufacturing to Asia. So they have to rethink how to manufacture in America 
and it's expensive to make in America. So they have to think frugally now, right? Out how to create, redesign the products, right? To make it, and this is where you will see more innovation happening among consumer goods. Procter and Gamble, and Unilever, mm -hmm. uh, they can teach a lot to people like uh, the electronics companies because of Procter and Gamble and Unilever know exactly how quickly to adapt the products to fit different price points and to produce very efficiently, you know, uh, by adapting the supply chains. So that agility uh, exists in fast goods, fast moving goods industry, uh, but in other industries, they have to learn that. Great. I think I will end the Q&A session uh, with this question. And I thank you very, very much, Navi, for thank your you time and sharing your knowledge. It was very insightful and interesting. To all of our participants, um, I will launch a very quick survey. Uh, it's about the feedback of the, sem uh, of the session. Uh, please fill it up. It helps us getting better. And all of you who are interested in our activities, um, as mentioned earlier, you can reach out to us on aesmuc.de and on our social media handles. If you want to reach out to Navi, you can reach out on his website, naviraju.com. Please uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, that's correct. Yes. Perfect. And I will wait some more for everyone to vote. And to sum it up the session, uh, as Navi, you mentioned, uh, Professor Anil Gupta, I would like to uh, state a quote from, uh, from Professor Anil Gupta to, to sum up and conclude the session. He says, Jugard means that with determination and ingenu ingenuity, you can do almost anything with almost nothing. That's correct. Well, with this, this is Vivek Modi signing off. Thank you so much for being here and uh, stay tuned. We are committed to bringing food for your thought and a treat to your intellect. We will be back with a lot of such interesting events. Thank you very much. Thank you, Navi, once again. Thank you very much. Be safe.